This is the second video in this short series on obstructive lung disease, and today I'll be discussing the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of asthma and COPD. The primary learning objectives are first to be able to describe the immune system's role in the pathogenesis of asthma and COPD, including a comparison of the mechanisms of inflammation in each, and second to be able to describe the pathophysiology of COPD including the mechanisms of hypercapnia and hypoxemia. I'll start with the immune system's role in the pathogenesis of the two main types of obstructive lung disease, which will lead into the more macroscopic physiologic derangements, which will ultimately help us to understand the symptoms of each. Two quick disclaimers with uh, the first part of this video. Uh, first, I appreciate that many viewers may know relatively little about the inner workings of the immune system. And second, the immunology of obstructive lung disease is extremely complex. As a quick demonstration of the latter issue, if you do a quick Google image search for pathogenesis of asthma, you'll find hundreds of diagrams outlining the relationship between different cell types like B cells and T cells, with arrows pointing all kinds of different directions, and various chemical mediators called interleukins liberally sprinkled throughout. And the most frustrating uh, aspect of these diagrams aren't their complexity, but rather their variety. No two examples seem to be showing the exact same process. Some highlight the role of mast cells and IgE antibodies, while some others highlight the role of the balance between two types of T cells called T helper 1 and T helper 2. And each provides a set of the important chemical mediators, yet each list is different. So why is this? Why can't these diagrams all agree with one another? Well, here's the short answer. The complete process is just too complex to show in one diagram, and science's understanding of it continues to change. What I'll present here regarding the immune system's role in asthma and COPD will be the extremely simplified version, which focuses only on those aspects which are the most critical to the process and which we are most certain reflects reality. In other words, this will not be the complete story, but it will be enough of the story for the routine clinical care of patients. With classical asthma, known more formally as allergic asthma or extrinsic asthma, the initial immunological trigger for the development of symptoms is exposure to an inhaled allergen, for example, pollen grains. When the allergen reaches the epithelium of the trachea or bronchi, it might be cleared from the body by mucociliary transport, avoiding an immunologic response completely, or it could be taken up by a cell type called dendritic cells, which exist throughout the body, including the airway epithelium. Dendritic cells, which contain numerous sheet-like extensions of the cell membrane, act as so-called antigen-presenting cells. This means that they take up an antigen like an allergen, process it, and then present it to T lymphocytes. Depending upon the circumstance, this could activate a cell type called CD4 T helper type 1 or CD4 T helper type 2. Relative overexpression of type 2 instead of type 1, uh, which is due to a combination of genetic and environmental factors, is a major aspect of allergic asthma. Once the dendritic cell has presented the processed allergen to T helper 2 cells, there are two key consequences. One response is release of a chemical mediator called interleukin-5, usually abbreviated IL-5. This increases activity from eosinophils, which then are responsible for release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and leukotrienes. The second consequence of T-helper-2 cells is stimulation of a type of B lymphocyte uh, called plasma cells, which is mediated by IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. These plasma cells then release an antibody type called IgE, which then binds to mast cells, causing release of preformed granules containing histamine, leukotrienes, and a compound similar to leukotrienes called prostaglandin D2. So in summary, exposure to an environmental allergen leads to sequential activation of T helper cells, eosinophils, plasma cells, and mast cells, with the end result being release of pro-allergic and pro-inflammatory compounds, histamine, leukotrienes, cytokines, and prostaglandin D2. So then what? 
The immediate acute response to these chemical mediators is a combination of bronchospasm, bronchial wall edema, and increased mucus secretion. Chronically, over weeks to years, uh, chronic exposure to the triggering allergens will eventually lead to bronchial hyperresponsiveness, chronic bronchial wall inflammation, and airway smooth muscle hypertrophy, which could lead to some degree of airway obstruction, uh, even in between exacerbations. What I've listed here as the acute and chronic response should not be confused with the so-called early and late phases of the allergic reaction, both of which would be considered part of an acute response. Irrespective of whether it's the acute or chronic response, the primary physiologic consequence is airway obstruction, which then leads to increased mechanical workup breathing, and if severe, will lead to hypoventilation and eventually to hyperinflation and life-threatening gas exchange abnormalities. There is a slight age dependence to the pathogenesis of asthma. Patients who initially present as children tend to show more allergic type hypersensitivity to typical antigens. As mentioned earlier, this is known as extrinsic asthma and is the process I just reviewed. In contrast, a minority of patients with asthma initially present as adults. They tend to show more non-allergic type sensitivity to irritant inhalational exposures, such as cigarette smoke and air pollution. This illness may seem to be initially triggered by acute pneumonia, and it's known as intrinsic asthma. Moving on to COPD, the immunological pathogenesis appears to not be as complex as with asthma, but the pathophysiology is quite involved. First, the overwhelming majority of COPD is caused by cigarette smoke. Inhaled smoke activates alveolar macrophages with release of IL-8. IL-8 can stimulate CD8 T cells to release TNF-alpha, among many other chemokines. IL-8 can also locally attract neutrophils, which release proteases, which are enzymes that digest other proteins. Next, let me show you the numerous downstream effects that the smoking-induced chronic inflammation has in the lungs. First, there is proliferation of a cell type called fibroblasts in the walls of these small airways. These are the cells which are responsible for creating the extracellular matrix and the structural protein collagen. When these are produced in excess, it leads to airway fibrosis and scarring. As mentioned, there is increased expression of proteases which destroy the lung parenchyma. There is airway mucous cell metaplasia, in which mucous glands develop in places where they are not previously present, and mucous cell hyperplasia, in which previously present mucous glands increase in size. These both result in a combination of increased mucus production and mucus viscosity. Defective immune response to infection leads to pathological bacterial colonization of the airways. And if present, chronic hypoxemia leads to pulmonary vasoconstriction and vascular remodeling, which results in pulmonary hypertension. So finally, what are the end results of these distinct pathological processes? In other words, what are the, are the um, consequences that we're going to actually see at the bedside or which a patient might actually complain of? Airway fibrosis, destruction of lung parenchyma, and increased airway mucus collectively lead to airway obstruction, hyperinflation, hypercapnia, which is an elevated carbon dioxide level in the blood, hypoxemia, which is a decreased oxygen level, and ultimately chronic dyspnea. The increased mucus also leads to a predisposition to develop mucus plugs, which as the term implies, occurs when a glob of mucus is so large and thick that it blocks a large airway, and the patient has difficulty clearing it with coughing. Mucus plugs can be life-threatening when they occur in a patient with severe pre-existing pulmonary disease. The increased mucus and bacterial colonization leads to a chronic cough, and the patients are also predisposed to pneumonia. Finally, pulmonary hypertension will lead to signs and symptoms of right heart failure, a condition occasionally known as core pulmonale. These signs and symptoms may include lower extremity swelling, ascites, elevated jugular venous pressure, and when particularly severe, liver dysfunction. Collectively, these consequences comprise the primary features of COPD. It's important to note here that there are some patients who develop COPD who do not smoke. 
in whom the pattern of pathophysiology may be slightly different. For example, patients with a genetic disease alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is an inhibitor of the proteases released by neutrophils, particularly one called neutrophil elastase. When the patient has a deficiency of this inhibition as a consequence of a defective gene, the result may be destruction of lung parenchyma as the predominant or even sole pathologic change in the lungs. Depending upon the specific genotype a patient has, the subsequent emphysematous changes in the lungs may occur spontaneously in young adulthood or may only occur if the patient begins smoking. There are still yet other patients who develop COPD despite no smoking history and no problems with the alpha-1 antitrypsin gene. The pathogenesis of the disease in these individuals is not as well understood. Occasionally, clinicians and some textbooks may refer to a dichotomy of COPD manifestations in which patients are said to be either a, quote, blue bloater or a, quote, pink puffer. Historically, blue bloaters were those patients with predominantly chronic bronchitis in whom the primary pathology was airway inflammation, which resulted in moderate to severe hypoxemia from hypoventilation, which would then lead to right-sided heart failure. They were blue because of cyanosis from the hypoxemia and bloated from the volume overload from the heart failure. This was a clinical diagnosis made upon examination of the patient. The pink puffers were those with predominantly emphysema. Their hypoxemia tends to be more mild, yet their work of breathing subjectively appears greater than in the blue bloater. These patients may suffer from COPD-related weight loss, which is referred to as pulmonary cachexia, the exact mechanism of which remains elusive. Unlike blue bloaters, diagnosis of a pink puffer requires something more than the exam. It requires radiographic or even pathologic evidence of emphysema. Although these two categories are still discussed in medical school lectures and in board review books, they are not clinically useful, since the vast majority of patients fall somewhere in the spectrum in between and have features of both extremes. When listing the primary features of COPD a few minutes ago, I mentioned hypercapnia and hypoxemia. I'm going to spend a minute apiece reviewing the mechanism of each in more detail. So first, hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is partly the consequence of airway inflammation, which leads to increased airway mucus and bronchial wall thickening. It is also partly the consequence of the destruction of lung parenchyma, which leads to decreased outward airway traction. Together, those three factors result in airway obstruction. Obstructed airways lead to air trapping, whereby not all of the air inhaled can be exhaled, which will result in hyperinflation. Hyperinflation has two consequences. One is the development of positive end expiratory pressure, and the other is flattening of the diaphragm. These lead to decreased tidal volume, abbreviated V sub T, which leads to a decrease in alveolar ventilation, abbreviated V dot sub A. Also contributing to the decreased alveolar ventilation is the decreased effective surface area of the alveolar capillary membrane caused by the parenchymal destruction. From the alveolar ventilation equation, we know that the partial pressure of CO2 in the arteries is inversely proportional to alveolar ventilation. In other words, the less alveolar gas is exchanged with the outside environment per unit time, the higher the arterial partial pressure of CO2 will be. Although initially, high CO2 levels felt by the central respiratory centers in the brainstem trigger an increase in ventilation, if this cannot be accomplished due to the aforementioned physical limitations, eventually the brain becomes less sensitive to changes in arterial CO2. This helps to sustain the hypercapnia in chronically hypoventilating patients. Now what about the hypoxemia? Of the four main mechanisms of hypoxemia in the human body, COPD commonly triggers three of them. First, from the alveolar gas equation, we know that high PaCO2 from hypoventilation will necessarily lead to decreased alveolar oxygen levels, which will necessarily lead to decreased arterial oxygen levels. Next, in normal healthy lungs, as a general rule, the best ventilated parts also tend to get the most blood flow, a balance called ventilation-perfusion matching, often abbreviated VQ matching. The matching is not perfect, but still reasonably good. 
However, in COPD, the combination of hypoventilation, which is not uniformly distributed across all lung segments, combined with parenchymal destruction, which is also not uniformly distributed, ventilation and perfusion becomes mismatched. Thus, some pulmonary blood flow gets wasted, so to speak, by traveling to parts of the lung where gas exchange is occurring less effectively. The final mechanism is related to the previous one in that it's caused by the decreased surface area of the alveolar capillary membrane, resulting in impairment of oxygen diffusion. For those interested, rate of diffusion is defined by Fick's law, where a rate of gas diffusion is directly proportional to the surface area of the diffusing membrane. If one-third of the lung volume has been replaced with giant bullae from parenchymal destruction, the effective surface area available for diffusion will have become significantly decreased, thus contributing to hypoxemia. For completeness's sake, the fourth mechanism of hypoxemia, which COPD does not directly involve, is right-to-left shunting of blood, for example, in congenital heart disease or in a pulmonary AVM. I'll end with a chart that compares the inflammation seen in asthma with that seen in COPD. In asthma, the primary cell types involved in generating and sustaining the inflammation are CD4 T cells, specifically type 2 helper T cells, eosinophils, plasma cells, and mast cells. In COPD, the inflammation predominantly involves macrophages, neutrophils, and CD8 T cells. The key chemical mediators in asthma are IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, while in COPD they are IL-8 and TNF-alpha. And finally, the predominant site of inflammation in asthma is the proximal airways, and in COPD it's the distal airways and lung parenchyma. That concludes this video on the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of asthma and COPD. The next video in this series will discuss the diagnosis and management of stable disease.